All right, y'all, Prophet David Taylor here. I'm here with my guest, prophetess, minstrel, and psalmist, Kathy Summers Kelly. We're going to do some talking today. Uh, we're going to hear what the Lord has to say. Wanted to share her insights with you. So welcome, Kathy. So good to see you. Hello there. How are you? I'm Hello, good. Thank you. <laughs> good. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, yes. For those that don't know you, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, all your worship, musical activities, and you don't have to give your whole resume, mm -hmm. just, you know. Right. I was, I was thinking in my head, like, mm, probably do that. <laughs> no, my name is, look, I sound like a robot. My name is, no, my name is Catherine <laughs> Summers, and I am uh, currently the worship of our director for Saints Church Ministries. I also have my own ministry, Catherine Summers Ministry. Um, but what else? I am a psalmist, prophet, teacher, now. I should just go down the line, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that would be interesting. Like, where do you have all five offices? But you know, um, I'm currently, a, you know, a worship, worship. Uh, I don't even know. You know what? With this pandemic, I don't even know what what I am. But I'm I'm a child of God. Put it that way. <laughs> Amen. Um, right, right. I'm a worship. I'm a worship leader. But one of the main things that I really do in teaching and training is the area of prophetic worship. I am an author of a book called The Dynamics of Prophetic Worship. Bam, bam, bam. Da, 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 da. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I do have recordings out. I do have one uh, recorded. Well, actually, one of, one of them is a cover song that I did by Misty Edwards called, Misty Edwards called Favorite One. And You Take My Breath Away is my own personal uh, 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 CD that I did probably about six, seven years ago. Um, what else is, what else is, okay, I'm, I'm going to let you ask me some more questions. What else? Oh, and I've been to over 30 nations, mm -hmm. probably 40 nations. I just don't want to cheat and count them twice. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? I do, I do. In the tabernacle. Huh? I said, yeah, I understand. Don't want to count them twice. <laughs> right. So um, teaching and basically teaching. And I think for the last 20 something years, I've been teaching, training and uh, the tabernacle of David, you know, teaching uh, teams and leadership. Um, how to establish prophetic teams, establish, establishing the tabernacle of David in the local church. What does that look like today? What does what is God requiring requiring of us, and what worship really looks like in this? You know, it, you know, for the local church and how that affects the whole world. What our, what we do in the church, how it affects the world. What our lifestyle does. So I've been kind of um, cultivating that type of a uh, message to a lot of leaders, a lot of people on. Um, our responsibility as worshipers and why God chose to why God chose David to worship over Moses. He didn't say I was going to build Moses' tabernacle. He didn't say I was going to build uh, Solomon's tabernacle. He says I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Mm -hmm. That really caught my interest. Why? You know, I have a, sometimes I'm still going why, why, why. The more I say why, the more I, I look into it. I'm seeing so many amazing things. So that has been my major focus as far as as a as an instructor. But as a, you know, even even as a way of life, but more of an instructor to build the kingdom. I think that's one of the ways that we expand the kingdom when we bring when worshipers come in. And I'm gonna stop right there. Okay. All right. Before Thanks. before the pandemic hit, were you finding more of a push towards prophetic worship, or were people open to that? Were people looking for that, or what was kind of going on before March in your travels? Actually, to be very honest with you. Right before, the, I would say right before the pandemic, most churches to most organizations that I was invited to as a guest, they were just embracing the prophetic worship. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you still have your you still have your traditions because the, your traditional church that don't want to mess with it. In other words, they'll bring a guest in. They like the way if you're skilled, psalmist, minstrel that can really flow in those dimensions, they'll bring you in. But for the most part, they may not want to, let's say, take the time to train, to activate. It's like it's like when they look at, let's say, churches like ours, Crusaders Church, or churches that move fluently in uh, the apostolic, or you know, uh, restoring that prophetic worship, prophetic teams, prophetic this, and that. You know, that's the apostolic. That's part of the apostolic model. And so when they see stuff like that, they like they think it's just something that's done overnight. They don't know that we've done, this been this is twenty years in making. When we, you know, well, well, Apostle John, our pastor, you know, began to bring people in and sent us out to be trained and do, you know, just kept that model, that thing going. Mm -hmm. So sometimes newer 
newer people who come into this revelation, they want it right now. I get it. You know, this generation, quick, fast, fast, quick, fast. But they don't take the time to really develop. Their leaders develop. So it's almost like you have the pop-up prophets, the pop-up, <laughs> the pop-up things. And then when I go back, or well, if I watch some of their videos, I'm going like, Dang, y'all went way back to grab that him. You know, went way back and got that song. But mm -hmm. it, it, it takes discipline to, to me, it takes discipline to actually um, actually live out of that realm. But the, the, the thing that always gets away with me is this, is that prophetic, the prophetic and prophetic worship has always been a part of worship. It's just that because to, one thing I think is because people have abused the prophetic and secondly is because people just, we just weren't taught that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I do. You know, because, uh, um, you know, I had a pastor tell me one time that prophets don't exist no more and that, you know, that God's not using prophets no more. And I was like, wow, you know, like, so you got, you got a wrong theology. You got a lot of reasons that people are finding it difficult to embrace the prophetic worship. Mm -hmm. And it's so much a part of our worship. If we are going to do, John, you know, John 4 and 21, I mean, 22 and 23, 21 and 23, we, go, we, we have to, do, if, if God has called us to worship him in spirit and truth, you have to be prophetic. You have to, how can you bypass that prophetic spirit of communicating with God, repertory, all those things. So when you incorporate that in your, in just your general worship service, and I'm like, you know, quote unquote, general worship service. People will understand how important it is to hear the voice of the Lord in their worship or that worship is alive because he lives in you. So if he lives in you, therefore he has a voice. If we're the church and he's the head, well, you know, uh, whose mouth he's going to use? I mean, come on. If Jesus came into the service and went, overtook the mic and went, do thou, do thou, you know, thou, the King James Version, those people, they pass out and say well, some, he was pulling some kind of tricks on them. So mm -hmm. whose mouth is he using? I always say, just think the same tongue he used to pray, pray, pray in tongues, the Holy Ghost, whatever, you know, this is the same tongue he's going to use to prophesy with. But if you tell them that sometimes they go like, ah. So what my model was is the prophetic is nothing that you can't control. It's always been there to govern. It's a governmental gift. So you ourselves one to another, you yourself to the voice of the Lord and be taught. And people say, well, how can you teach people this? Well, call, go to Samuel. Samuel had the school of the prophets. You can't teach people the dynamics of things. I'm not telling you what to say. I'm not telling you how to prophet, what to say. Thus said the Lord. I'm just giving you instructions on the word, and that is a part of God's kingdom that we do train to to teach people how to move in a prophetic realm. You know. Okay. Now so, you you said a lot there, so I want to pause for our audience because you used a lot of. That's okay. You used a lot of uh, terms that we're very familiar with, but they may not be. Uh, she talks about the tabernacle of Moses, tabernacle of David, tabernacle of Solomon. David is the one that established the pattern that's most honored uh, by the Lord in worship. He's the one that established the 24-7 worship. He's the one that organized all of the priests. Uh, he had the speaking priest, the singing priest, and the standing priest, or what we ended up calling ushers. Uh, he's the one, if you remember, at the end of his life, gave a massive offering. And that is why God and came and wrote Solomon a blank check. People think that God just came to Solomon for no reason. No, David gave millions, maybe even tens of millions right before he died. That is why the Lord broke up that or broke open the heavens over Solomon and said, anything you want, I'll give it to you. And most importantly, in Second Chronicles, when they got on one accord, the glory of the Lord actually came into the room and the glory of the Lord was so strong until they couldn't stand the minister. That means the the Shekinah glory, the presence of God was so thick that they had to stand still and stop worshiping. Now, all that is supposed to be our normal as Christians. And that's what Kathy's talking about. That's what I'm talking about. See, I just got through ministering on what you just said about people that are still arguing about the apostolic and the prophetic. Okay, well, see, they said three and God said five. Okay, God said apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. They said, we'll just take evangelist, pastor, and teacher. That means you are dysfunctioning, okay? You are bones out of joint. You're not doing what the Lord said do. And you're not going to be able to get the fullness of what God has for you. The Spirit of God will give you a prophetic word on the spot, in the moment, for that time, for that now. He'll give you a prophetic song. He'll give you a warning. He'll give you a commandment. He'll give you an encouragement. Because He's a true and living God that's with us now. That's what people are missing. 
That's the difference between regular religious worship, where you've already planned all the songs, where the choir is going to come with an A and B, where Sister Viola is going to come in our own way, where Pastor only going to preach <laughs> for 15 minutes, and then you're going to eat some chicken and go home. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> versus, versus letting the Holy Spirit have his way, because as she and I have both experienced in our services, our pastor has told us his goal is to have a different experience every Sunday, and that's always true. Uh, one time I remember, because it happened with both Kathy and Apostle Christy, Apostle Christy got up and asked for healing testimonies. First two people gave testimonies. The third person came up and asked for healing, and then it turned into a healing line. One of the times Kathy was preaching, she started off with something, but she said, you know, the Holy Spirit is telling me this. The people in here got some ailments. So I need y'all to stand up or come up because we're going to get healed. And she said, I don't know why I'm going this way, y'all, but this way I'm going. See, that's when you are yielded to the Spirit. That's prophetic. What is the Lord saying now? Through the, what is the Spirit saying to the church? If you don't have that or you don't know what I'm talking about, you just have religion. That's why it's dead. That's why ain't no power in it. That's why ain't nobody getting healed. Okay, so I just wanted to throw those out there because we use a lot of terms that we're very familiar with, but it's new to to some people. Right. Um, and it, you know, that, that's, I think that's amazing. And, um, and when I say that's good and that's amazing, sometimes even like like I had a friend just recently said to me, she said, I'm going to preach this a basic message tomorrow. And she said, because I have a lot of babes that come in and stuff like that. I said, what do you mean? I said, it's nothing basic. So what do you mean the basic message? I said, it's nothing basic about the gospel. I said, let's say this. You're going to preach the good news tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good news. And I said, because... I said, well, you know, because they don't understand a lot of this stuff. I said, well, you didn't either when you first got saved. <laughs> right. Because we have a lot of Holy Spirit to, there's a lot of Holy Spirit to have his way. When you preach the good news, when you preach what God, if you be obedient to that and preach what God tell you to preach, say what, sing what God say do, that it's going to reach the people that it needs to reach. And I said, the, the scriptures say in Psalms 8, and out of the mouth of babes have God ordained strength. So listen, even out of the mouth of babes, God has ordained strength. And then that same scripture says, what is a man that, that God is so mindful of him that he is crowned him with glory? Mm -hmm. But God is when think about this, when you're mindful of something or someone that you have you have a thought pattern toward them. You have things that you are thinking of toward them. I said, so let's 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 focus on like we 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 teach by example, mm -hmm. and then when we get them in our square. Then we then we give them a lot of details. You know, when we, like our circle here, there, mm -hmm. then we feed them the details. Then we come that we become that shepherd. You know, although you might be apostles and prophets to whatever you want to say, but like David, I say one of the greatest things I've, I learned about King David is this: but being on the backside of the desert, he learned how to be a shepherd to sheep. You know, you know, he learned how to be a shepherd before a king. And I always used to think to myself, what is what what is necessary for him to why is it necessary for David to have a shepherd's mentality, mm -hmm. a pastoral mentality? Because one, the anointing on his life gathers people. Mm -hmm. and I think that no matter what office you have or what you call to do, you've got to have a love for people. Because I know I'm, I'm I'm stretching out there, but you have you have to have a love for people, you know a genuine love for people. So I said, okay, you're out here, David, and all these different types of circumstances of life all around you in the place where you've been put or ostracized because of, you know the story, mm -hmm. but then you still have this sheep, you, you have more of a pastoral or a sheep herders. You had to care for someone other than yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And so what we do as apostolic people, we can't afford to lose that Especially when we dealing, especially when we teaching or preaching, but when we get people in our circles, then we can get them details. But the good news is always the best news. So I said, all I have to say is give them all, all the words. Give them the big, the little, and the middle. <laughs> <laughs> give it to them because the Holy Spirit is gonna is gonna teach them, but you but it's gonna help them. That's what I've I've seen that the Holy Spirit is gonna help them. So sometimes I don't draw back from using certain terminologies, especially if I could say, turn the aim is 9 and 11. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I say, turn the aim is, I use a term that's used in the Bible that they can look it up. That's how, that's that's what used to happen to me when preachers, I was like, what is that? I don't know who David is. Well, 
Abigail who? You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it would cause me to go and look up and find out who these people were in the Bible and why God was talking to me the way he was talking to me. So I applaud you for your dynamic because it's big here, okay? Your whole <laughs> dynamic is big. But go ahead. Well, thank you. And uh, one of the things that that is still not utilized that I have seen and done that needs to come into our normal is that believers don't understand that worship is a weapon. And I don't just mean spiritual warfare is a phrase that people have worn out because they say everything spiritual warfare. But this is what I mean specifically. In the old covenant, if they got in trouble, if they got surrounded by enemies or anything that was happening in Israel, that took away their peace. They would go before God and pray, and God would give them a specific form of worship. Specifically, when they were taking cities or taking land, sometimes God would just tell them to march and don't say nothing. Sometimes God would tell them to break a pitcher. Sometimes God tell them to stomp on the ground. Sometimes God, many times God tell them just shout. Because when I tell you to, just lift your voice and shout. And people don't understand prophetic movement. When God is doing something in the spirit, he'll have you do a corresponding movement in the natural out here that corresponds with that invisible plan. But what happens is there's a physical manifest manifestation. That's how Jericho's walls fell. And what people don't understand, because we did this when I was a part of church where we did this one time. In service one time, we were worshiping and the pastor was an apostle. And he said, the Lord is telling me to point your finger at your problems. And when you get home, they're going to be gone. So he said, think of your number one problem. And so we all said it. Then he said, point your finger towards the east and praise God. And we did it. When we got home, debts was paid, attitudes was changed, whole kind of stuff. We saw it happen in real time. And I've discovered we still, as a church, have not graduated to using worship like it's used in the Old Testament to where you get in trouble and we gather together. We go in the spirit and we ask the Lord, how do you want us to praise you? Is there a dance? Is there a song? Is there a tambourine, a timbre? What do you want us to do? And when you do the movement that the Lord tells you to do through the Holy Spirit in the moment, it corresponds to what he's having the angels, the hosts do to actually combat your problem. And a whole lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about. They've been used to singing them them same old dull dead songs from 20 years ago with no power until they don't even understand that when we get on one accord, And that's why it's got to be prophetic. You have to ask the Holy Ghost. You can't assume. You can't assume that you know what the Lord is saying. You got to ask him. So I I live for the day where that can become a normal as well, where people can come in the house of God. And before they get home from church, we have worshiped God in the way he told us to. And the problems are fixed. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I agree with you because... uh... Again, you said a lot of people don't don't understand don't understand that praise is a weapon. That our praise is a worship. I mean, our praise is a weapon unto the Lord. Yes. Um, you know, when we worship God, one of the one of the things that it means to worship God, it means to to lick like a dog. In other words, you know how your if you think about a dog, mm-hmm. how how your best you know that says that dog is man's best friend. Mm-hmm. You know, people who these are for dog lovers who might understand this terminology. Uh, better and you know it's it's a hummus it's a low place lonely place where you submit yourself to God when you if you're gonna truly worship God you have to admit or uh, you believe that he is God yeah you worship believe you worship you have you cast your confidence and everything is in what you believe and so when we humble ourselves before the Lord and we exalt him we say you are king of kings and you are Lord of you are seated above everything you know, that is our worship. We, 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 you know, we're called to, of course, we know we're called to worship him in spirit and truth. That's our worship, our truth, our way, our life, not just our song service. Because I always say the song service is just a part of our devotion in a, you know, building setting. Mm-hmm. But that's not the totality of worship. Worship has a lot to do with what we say, what we do, what we eat, how we posture ourselves, how we are even in the marketplace. Because if you think about the world, the world has no problem with declaring that Buddha is my king. Or mm-hmm. for, for women who go to these nail spas or whatever, the first thing you see when you walk in the door, you see the statue there, and you see the food, the offerings that they make. See, the worship <laughs> is so connected to the marketplace, they don't even... That's so right. What we 
Christians do this. We separate out. Mm-hmm. We, 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 we don't understand that it's a, we, we say we know it's a way of life, but we don't operate that way because we lack the understanding that we don't want, we, we don't want to be uh, ridiculed because you have a lot of Christian people that say, well, I'm really a Christian and I worship, well, if you're a Christian, well, what, who, what God did you, what God do you worship? But then, then you have the theology issue, like quote unquote, some of your celebrity people say it's one is more than one way to God or to the kingdom. So then you have a lot of uh, mixture in because uh, I'm go, I'm going somewhere with that. You have a lot of mixture in Christianity. So therefore, you cannot worship God in spiritual because you are still battling with mixture. So how can you begin to see that your praise is a weapon? But I'm reminded of the scripture when you were talking. I was trying to pull it up. It's Psalms 1, 100. And I believe that's um, verses 4 and 5. It says that enter into its gates with thanksgiving. This is basic. And I want to, just for the lack of terms, I'm going to use the word basic. And it says enter into its gates with thanksgiving and enter its courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless, bless his, his name. name. Mm-hmm. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endure to all generations. Now enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Now most people, you you know, because of our traditions, you, that they say, well, how do you really enter into the to the Lord? Just this is simple. How do you enter into the presence of the Lord with thanksgiving? You know, that's why you know the order of praise and worship. Oftentimes, we might start off with praise because mm-hmm. it's like you don't want to be traditionally religious in your own apostolic you know way. Because even you know we can be that way. But thank God for the breath of God, which is his prophetic, that gives us something, that he creates something new that he has, he wants to do in the service. But the, the, the Bible says this, you know, enter into his gates with and it's given into his course with praise. Like it gets out as we begin to enter into the presence of the Lord. You know, we got to be thankful no matter what, with thanksgiving, thanking God, glorifying his name, magnifying, you know, to make him big, magnifying. Why do you do that? Why do we, you know, some, have you ever just asked us to, why does God need to be magnified in the sense, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the sanctuary? Because it's a scripture that talks about praising him in the sanctuary. Well, you know, that, the answer you know, to that is because, why? because we need to, we need to focus on the solution and not the problem. You need to make him bigger here and give a focus to your faith Absolutely. because that's what releases his power. He doesn't need us to be who he is. But what we need is his power to be activated in our lives. And the way you pull it from the invisible to the visible is through faith, which means your picture of him has to be right in here or else it's not going to come through in the fullness. And you've got to continue to make him bigger than whatever it is that you're facing. So that's really, uh, it's like fasting. Fasting don't move God. Fasting moves you so you can hear God better. Well, magnifying God don't, don't change God. It changes you so you can understand who you're talking to. And once you understand what you're talking to, then you can get the faith you need to defeat your enemies. Because as long as you make your problems bigger, you're, you're literally short-circuiting your faith, like a bad light switch. So, right. yeah. That's a, and then it brings you into, like I always say, you, when you really press it to, like that principle right there, that biblical enter into his gates with thanksgiving, you know, you, he, you become God aware. Yes. You become more and more, and it takes you talk because because sometimes you don't all people don't always get this right away, you know. Like when people let's think about it, just something like this: you just come into the kingdom, you just got saved, and all that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden you had, it, but you had some type of encounter, a God awareness, something happened in your life, you came to God. So now you get you get over to your praise and worship lifestyle if, if you get to the right right church. <laughs> or and the reason I say right church because. I had an experience where, you know, when I first got saved, where the, it was a pastor of my mom's church, and he was like, he wanted me to join the choir and all kind of stuff, and I was going like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, I didn't even understand, I didn't even know about the prophetic or prophetic worship or anything like that, but I knew I didn't want to be in no choir. I knew I didn't want to be standing up there in the hollering, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like certain things that it didn't, it didn't make a connection to, the quiet didn't make a connection for me, like my experience, my encounter with God that brought me into yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's what has to be. You keep, you keep getting back to that lifestyle thing. 
the, the choir that I saw, what I was hearing, the, the stuff they were singing, it did not match at all. Even though I was ignorant and didn't understand what I was looking at, I knew enough to know that that didn't match. You know? mm -hmm. They didn't match. <laughs> okay, now, now that's a very important point. Now, I want the audience to get that as well. She just described the difference to you between religion, which is form and fashion, choir going to sing today, choir coming with an A and B, Sister Viola get to sing all the solos. They're arguing about who the louder soprano is. All that churchy stuff that, that people tend to do. There's no Even if the anointing that's in you flows, it's not the maximum power. It's not the maximum use. It's not the highest use of why God is putting it for. Those are carnally minded people who think that worship is just something you do almost arbitrarily. It is not something that's arbitrary. It's a way that opens the heavens. It's a way to usher God's glory in the room. But that's so you can prophesy. That's so the Holy Spirit can say to the congregation, this is what I'm saying to you now. And if you don't think that's biblical, I will remind you, audience, Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus said seven times, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, not did say, not will say. What's the Holy Ghost saying right now? Seven times in Revelation 2 and 3. And that's many times what people are missing. You don't have a rhema word, a right now word, a fresh breathe word. And what God will do is God will prepare you for the week with the word he gives you on Sunday. God will prepare you for your fight with the word he gives you on Sunday. God will set you free of any burdens you came in with and refresh you so you, you can attack your week with re renewed strength. That, that's all what you get from prophetic worship and so many more benefits. But if you're still arguing about, you know, we, you know, we don't, we, we wear white on first Sunday and, you know, next Sunday is black and you're still arguing about I'm in charge of the kitchen and I use corn oil and we don't use sunflower oil up in this church. And you're still arguing about, no, we don't give the kids real grape juice. We don't give them real wine. No, we give them, you still arguing about stuff like that? That's why you ain't got no power. That's religion. That's form and fashion. Okay, that ain't where the Holy Ghost is. Okay, all right, now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Uh, what kind of online worship structures do you personally like to do or have you helped people do? And like, the, people are doing so many different things now. And some people did not transline, uh, translate well to online worship. They didn't translate into it at, well at all. So some people kind of stumbled in it. Some people still don't know what they're doing. So what kind of stuff do you like to do online and, and what are you helping people do in terms of setting up online worship structures? Um, actually, I do, uh, I do several churches that I actually have been, I do online several churches. I still work with a praise and worship still team. I don't, because we don't, I'm not traveling right now. Mm -hmm. I just do it in the way of the Zoom or StreamYard, whatever uh, outlet that we have available. Uh, and then some churches have they used to, they're still using a Facebook Live, but we just have a private group. So I'm probably okay. in, right now I'm probably mentoring. I have about four churches that I do once a month. But I'm also the other thing that I am I am an instructor for Eagle Institution under the leadership of um, Dr. Dr. Pamela Hardy mm -hmm. and uh, her husband. I, I, what did, I just can't remember the Hardys. I want to say apostles, the apostles. Party, um, Eagles Institution. You can actually Google that. I'm one of the instructors. This was not before the pandemic was my first year. So I had started already having the online experience with students. Then I have like students that are overseas and I have students that are here in the, you know, in the States and things like that. So with all those logistics that come with that, I had to learn it. And I also have a personal assist assistant that actually helped me with this before this whole pandemic came about. But when the pandemic came, it increased the volume of uh, uh, people who wanted, still wanted to learn. What most leaders were doing, they started to feel it was necessary to develop their worship teams in the era of their foundation. Like what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. So I would tell, I would do a class about an hour and a half, you know, something like that, and recommend certain books of, you know, my book, of course. <laughs> <laughs> recommend certain you know certain books and so uh, just sort of teach and train and giving them some real foundation but like right now I'm getting ready to come up on finals for because we usually we have this meeting in Dallas but again because of the pandemic we can't do it so we've got these these things are 
professional. They have, they have um, I want to say, engineered a way where everybody could do the online graduation, get their certificates, credit certificates, and different things like that. So I work, I'm working with a, an amazing group of people. Then I'm doing, I've done some things with Impact University. Crusade, but under the, you know, Apostle Johnson University, I did a, I just taught a class there uh, on prophetic worship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's like, they have thousands of students who come through that. So right now, um, a lot of people are into their studies. Like, so this is appropriate. This is, this, this, this live is appropriate because people want, now they have time and the religion is being cut away. You've been <laughs> torn away from the building. Now you're going to sit your hand down and learn. That's right. <laughs> no, I just got through I just got through talking about that very thing because God has torn down all of the old religious things that we were doing. And if people are fighting tooth and nail, trying to get back to the way it was, and you have missed a point of the summer. You have absolutely missed a point because all that what we was doing ain't coming back. We're supposed to be doing what the Lord is saying doing doing right now. Uh now let me ask you this question. Do you think that hymns have a place in worship today? You know, I'm going to tell you something. Based, yes. And the reason that I say that, 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 that see, the hymn, a hymn is really nothing. If you really look up just the basic definition of a hymn, it's a song of praise. Mm -hmm. It's really a song of praise. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do, I think it's in Ephesians 5 and 18 and 19, Paul says, well, he says, he talks about being wise and redeeming time and not being drunk. And not, you know, you know that scripture. Yes. He also said, for singing with psalms, hymns. hymns. He said, psalms, hymns, and spiritual, spiritual songs, songs. Right. Unto, the, uh, unto the Lord. And so hymns are, by the time you write a song or record it, it's now your hymn. You know, it becomes a hymn. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I think we all started, because when you look in the world, you have your Tasha Cobbs. And, you know, if you want to if, if use those type of terms, you know, you know, those are hymns. You know, they be, after you've written that stuff, even if I take a prophetic song mm -hmm. and I record that prophetic song, it could be categorized in somebody's category as a hymn, eventually a hymn or whatever. But the thing is, we just have the, it's the Holy Spirit that helping us. The I said us, right? Mm -hmm. That helps us to know when to sing certain songs and why. You know, because. The average definition, the average understanding of him is, is a, for, for most people, and that means safe and unsafe, is is somebody that got a book and you just singing out old hymns. <laughs> That's part true. <laughs> That's part true because they are to, well, another word, another meaning for commemorate is to record because God told David to commemorate. Mm -hmm. So, to ask, so that means that, so for us in the 2020, 20th century, 21st century, we record. We, we live stream people. You make records, you still live in live stream. You don't see the royalty unless you do a concert. But, um, it's documented, but thank God for Abscap, DMI, and places like that. The publishing companies where you can have copyrights. At least you can be a writer and you can make all that cheese, right? I know what you're doing. Right, right. <laughs> that's but, right. For the most part, that's, that's what it's like. So, with, um, and let me say this. In, I am I, I am convinced that every prophetic song that is saying is not necessary to be recorded. I'm, it's just not one of those things to be recorded. But there is a place for each one of us because we are all we're created from the, from, the, from from one of the most amazing poets in the world. And you know his name is Jesus. Most the, uh, amazing Elohim creators is Jesus. We, we have that image and likeness. And so we are poets. We have that part in us. Mm -hmm. If we want to, we can sit down and we can pen our songs. Some people are more disciplined. Some people actually have a gift to do this. But I think just like we can all sing the new song, mm -hmm. and like we can all sing the song of the Lord and because it's part of our grace on our life, I believe that if you take the time to sit down and write, you know, and just write like you would write anything else, you can actually activate that gift. That gift is you know, God is the greatest creator to me, the greatest artist. I always say, God, you're always writing things in the sky. So there's always writing involved. That's right. You know, something, you know, miracle signs and wonders. And then you have, we have our expression to articulate that. And there is always going to be writing from beginning to end. Is it, I, I, I like what the Bible says. He's the author and finisher, finisher of, our you know, of our faith. 
he's an author. And so this to me, you know, people are learning how to sit down and discipline their soul, to, you know, and get yourself and learn some biblical foundation. First thing, and I mean, that's the second thing. But the first thing is what's happening is we're going back to the cool of the day with God. The Bible says that Adam walked with God. So we have to come back to that place of where, where the, before, uh, and I call it the garden place, and I will call it the place before Adam sin type of deal. You know, that type of deal, just had that conversation. Because people would say, oh, this is the reset. Yeah, for lack of better terms, I would use that terminology too. But what is the first thing that God, the first thing that happened before Adam had a wife was he established worship. God, he, he had an intimacy with God. And so if something is being, uh, if the world is being pushed over to a whole new world, a whole new world, you know, a whole <laughs> mm-hmm. world, then that means that everything has to change. And the only way that that has to change, you have to see it in the eye of the beholder because you become what you behold. And so if God's doing something new, I mean, the old patterns had their, they had their, you know, they had their time. Mm-hmm. But then what about God springing forth and doing something new? knew the only way I can grasp that or be a visionary to be able to release that as a psalmist mm-hmm. or worship to give expression to that is I must hold who he is. Because I just have mixture go that. Well, uh, first of all, a lot of the things that we count traditionally as hymns are very Western. And we're talking yeah. about different types of hymn writers in terms hymns right. are strophic. Traditional hymns are strophic, and what that means is that it's the same music set to different texts. So we sing the same music over and over again, two, three, four, five standards with different lines. The best thing about our Western hymns and their structure is that they're some of the strongest melodies in Western American music history. Uh, And for those of you that don't know, rhythm is designed to minister to your body, harmony ministers to your soul, but melody ministers to your spirit. Nothing can get a congregation on one accord faster than a strong melody. And that's why you don't have to sing a hymn for a long time to bring people on one accord. You can feel the power of God turn on like that when you sing Amazing Grace is Something Familiar because we're all on one accord. And it's the one accordness that releases more of the power of the Spirit. So that's part of the power of what we would call traditional hymns because they would sound different in every country. And in terms of what you're talking about, the new thing, I am writing new, I'm writing, I have a 150 hymn project, so I'm writing a new hymn for every song. So I release those once a month, just based on what you're saying. They have more of the traditional style, meaning I made them very strong in melody, but the lyrics are all based on the chapter of the song that I brought them from. Because of what you're saying, I'm like, okay, we've been singing some stuff for a long time and we shouldn't let it go. But what about some new stuff? What are still based on scripture, still strong in melody, still giving us the power to come on one accord, but just some new stuff because we're supposed to sing to the Lord a new song. And so, and so that's another thing that we want to encourage the psalmist and the minstrels, minstrels watching, that if you've got that scribe anointing, you feel something, if it's something that you might think is unorthodox or something that hasn't been seen before, that means God gave it to you. So write it, sing it, do it, whatever it is, bring it forth. I agree with writing is a, I think that that's the whole thing, discipline ourselves to sit down and write and just bring out our thoughts, you know, put them on paper, mm-hmm. write the vision. So it's like, even when you write these songs out, you're writing the vision, it's still part of that whole random. I wanted to, I wanted to bounce back a little bit because the scripture came to me when we were talking about um, the voice of God or God, a part of our prophetic worship or why it's necessary for God's voice to be in the church. There's a scripture and it's Hebrews 2 and 12. It's saying, he's, Jesus is saying, well, this is Apostle Paul, but it's like, a, but I want, I call it a best God type of a, a word. He's, he's saying, 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 I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing unto thee. And this is Paul talking about Jesus, but it's actually, a, it's him prophesying that Jesus said, I will declare in the midst of the church. One translation, another translation to say, I will declare in the congregation. Mm-hmm. So, well, who, well, 
or how, what do you, you know, the question is, well, who, who you could declare it to, who you talking to? I will declare thy name unto thy brethren. So that means that you and I, the congregation, we're lifting up the praise of God, un, you know, giving God glory. It says, in the midst of the congregation, will I sing unto thee? Will I sing unto thee? Well, I'm not singing to you. I'm not singing necessarily to you. He's saying that I will sing with my brethren unto you. I'm joined in the congregation of worship with the saints, with my brethren, mm -hmm. and I'm going to sing unto you. But how does that happen? I always tell people, how does that happen is he uses you to open up your mouth and you sing over the people the song of the Lord. And he's very much a part of the praise and worship. Now, I'm going to find this Christian before we get out, but I believe it's in first, the first and second Corinthians around the 14th of the name where it says, when a non-believer comes into the service, you're familiar with that. Yes, word. yes, yes. Never been trained. You know, and they and the, and the, and everybody says if everybody prophesy. Now, technically, you know that the congregation. I always like to do the framework. You know that the, everybody in the congregation. And let's say you come in and you, you see people. Oh, la 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 la. You know, description mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. But why does the scriptures literally say prophesy? The reason that it says prophesy is because really there's no separation between true worship and prophecy. There's no separation. That's so when, right. When true worship goes forth. The spirit of prophecy comes to the room. Why? Because Revelation 19, 19 10 says, Worship God for the testimony, testimony of Jesus, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. prophecy. That's right. Spirit of prophecy. So that's why a, nun, a person who's never, ever been in the prophetic companies or anything like that can come in. And the Bible says that this person will be convinced that God is in you, they'll be persuaded, not because of anything you say, but it was the worship that transformed them. And they heard the voice like they said, they will fall on their face and say that God is, is in you of a truth. That's right. Because the Absolutely. secrets of your heart will be revealed. Absolutely. Preaching is God talking to us. Prophecy is God talking to you. And that's why many times people just start breaking down because it's so personal. Because there are things that the Spirit of God is saying through a human vessel that there's no way you could know. And that's how God lets you know, this is me talking to you. This is me and you. And that's why many times if people come in with hard hearts or unbelief or burdens, if they get a prophetic word and the Spirit of God starts walking through your life, you will know of a surety that the maker of heaven and earth loves you, knows you, and sees you because you will know there's no way that person could possibly know all the things we're talking about. That's right. Now, let's let's move on to this question. I want uh, I want to ask you do you find a difference in ministering to the younger generation now? People that are like 25 and under, do you find they are more or less open to the prophetic? Are they more focused on uh, beat heavy music? Do they want the more hip hop driven stuff? Like what has been your experience if there's been any kind of difference? Well, for me, as, a, as my, because I'm an artist, that's mm -hmm. the thing. For me as an artist, I never really have a problem with young adults. Actually, I find them quite fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh -huh. The only my only concern is 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 what model are they living on or what they've been taught taught. Because I look at this thing where, and I always say like, if you go, if you've ever seen those uh heavy metal parties and where everybody jumping off the stage and jumping around like look like look you know like. The telly, telly parties, whatever you call it, telly, 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 yeah, they head banging, they head banging, yeah, 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 all right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, come on, we, we can be radical. Nobody can really tell you how to work, how to really do that. But there is, but I'm telling you, there is a way that is right. There's mm -hmm. a way that seems right to man. And so sometimes the younger those can look at something that looks like it's moving and exciting and grasp that model but never have the foundation like what's behind it. So some some are quote unquote, and it, and it can go all across the board, whether you're old, young, or in the middle or young, that they don't, they really, just, it's, it's, a, it's an outward performance and not necessarily, it, it doesn't come from within. It's not yes. something that's coming from within. So if you, if you are young and you're in the church, this is mine, this is banging, the music is, everything is contemporary, they have the right music, uh, right equipment, the sound is popping off, off graphics and stuff like that. You can get excited about the, the cosmo of it all, you know, the cosmetics of this this thing, but never have a true encounter with God. Never. Right. You can be, you can be stimulated 
inspired and everything else, but you never really feel the presence of the Lord because we've used the cosmo or the cosmetics of this drapery, this dresser, dressing up this thing. And that's not worshiping God as spirit of truth. That is my concern. I've seen it, you know, to the places I've traveled. And but when I when the, for me, when I've come into that environment, they're like, whoa, whoa. Man, you, you you can still say stuff like you could sing or what was that? Like they they, they could detect something, mm-hmm. you know. Cause mm-hmm. Anybody because I just, when I was a, when I was a heathen, a woman sang over me, and I detected something. I'm like, what is that? It terrified me. Mm-hmm. They can the fear of the Lord. So I think that for us in dealing with any age, because God is no respect of person. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? No, I do. That it's, there's a sound that we have, and it's the sound of the voice of the Lord. It doesn't even matter if I'm singing a, a learned song or anything like that. Why, 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 why is it different for me? Why do some people, when you open, they open their mouth, you can tell something different immediately. Because we are, first of all, that person has purposely, because we're called to do this, separate themselves to the Lord. Yes. The other thing is this, we learn to worship God in spirit and truth. It is a lifestyle. Did I say that that person was perfect? No, I didn't. It's not about singing out of my gift or for anybody else, but there is a distinction in sound. And then, you know, and I don't argue with people with that anymore. So you can say what you want to. The Bible says, I always say, if you have a nice voice, mm-hmm. decent voice, mm-hmm. nice, decent, this is the measuring rod that I'm using, people will listen to you. But it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. And so That's right. every singer, psalmist, whoever you call yourself, you know, you, de- you should desire the anointing more than you should then you desire fans of your voice. I'm serious. That's that that makes the difference when God sees that your voice has the ability to penetrate heavens, the heavens, mm-hmm. move things out of the room, move things in the heart of man, because God goes up to this heart mm-hmm. and move and begin to deal with a person's heart so he could get in there and work on it. Because you got the you got the look the little devil on the other side working to get in there. Mm-hmm. So God's working on the heart too. People don't believe that God come out to your heart. Yeah, he does. He wants to get to your heart. That's where all that stuff is, all that hurt, all that trauma, whatever that is. So why? He said that they, why does the Bible say David had a heart after God? Or you know, so in other words, a psalmist like that with a heart after God. So you can imagine the impact of when he played, uh, when he sang. Because his heart was focused after God. So, now, the last time I was around some 25-year-olds, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how it's what you said. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with praising God the way you know and what you see right. and what's, what, what, what you know or what's right, right for your group. But there is a distinct difference between whether or not the Lord is in the room and you can and see if you grow up under the anointing or you spend any time under the anointing, you know what it is and you know what it's not. And it's not one of those things you can convey. It's one of those things you have to experience because you can. It's just like those people who said when Paul encountered them, he said, have you been filled since you've been saved? And they said, we have never even heard. We don't even know if there's such a thing as a Holy Ghost. And so if you know the anointing, the anointing of God is un mistakable and it is unfakeable. You can't fake the Holy Ghost and you can't miss that there, there's something divine about that. And so what is supposed to happen is that early in your life, if you get used to it, it's part of the foundation to let you know that you can always come home. The reason that these young people are killing themselves is because they ain't got nowhere to go. The reason that they're killing people in the streets because they ain't got nowhere to go. But if you knew the anointing of God, if you knew that presence and that glory, then no matter how far out there you get, there's something to come back to because you felt him, not just a style or not just a beat or not just hanging out with your peers. And see, that's another reason why I want to do this interview because I'm concerned that that is being lost between generations because as you go through life, it's your job to pass on what you know to the next generation. Right. They have their own battles to fight, but they're supposed to benefit from what you've been through. And I'm seeing that a lot of people are completely missing the personal relationship part. Right. They, they got the style and they got the, the beats and the jumps and the harmonies and the, all the different kind of stuff. 
But the one thing they don't have is knowing the Lord for they self. And I have said recently right. on my broadcast, some people are going to have to face the fact. Some people, you are never going to shake your pastor's hand again. You are never going, you are, and especially if you went to a big church, you probably didn't talk to him or her anyway. And some people, you ain't going to never shake their hand again in this life. So what are you going to do when you're in isolation? What are you going to do when it's just you in your home? Do you have a prayer room in your home? Do you have a worship room in your home? Do you know how to bring the presence of God in your house, in your space? That's what I'm talking about. That is not beat or age dependent, but I am seeing a right. difference in people that know what I'm talking, that know how to do that and don't have no idea what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Right. <coughs> oh, excuse me. It's just where, it's, 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 it's how they were, how they grew up. That's why I say it depends on where they're at, you know, where they, where, where, where they find their models from and different things like that. And I get it, you know. Where they find their models. That's good. No, that's good. Where they find their models. That's really good. What kind of, because the model I had was old school black people that sang to the power of the Holy Ghost came down. They sang to the Lord, came in the room. Then they called the kids up to the altar and they said, you ain't leaving until you get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's how I grew up. So I knew when the Lord was in the room and not. Uh, my grandmother is the one that caused me to become a Christian because when I would come into her house, I could feel God around and I didn't know what I was feeling, but I knew it was something. And she glowed and it just wasn't with the oil she put on her face. And I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't articulate what it was, but I could tell when I was around her that the very angels of God, the very peace of God, because the peace of God is tangible. It's not a physical substance, but it has a weight and you can feel it. I could feel it in the room around her. And that's how I knew God was real because of my grandmother. So, so that's what I feel like we need to be passing on. Like you said, when you come in, there's a distinction if you open your mouth and the spirit of God is driving it. And young people need to feel that because they become hungry for it. And that's how you develop that hunger and that thirst after righteousness. Because if you ain't hungry for it, you ain't going to chase it. You're going to chase whatever you're hungry for. Does that make sense? Right. Because the, and they know better. And you really will know better. They ain't gonna, I mean, it's just, just what it is. I mean, but I, I was saying the other part of that is our fault. I believe that you have leaders who have ported the anointed out of fear, you know, of whatever their identity issues were, mm -hmm. never really tried to reach out to the next generation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it almost been like a Saul and David type of relationship. Oh, wow. These young leaders uh -huh. won't, you know, don't really want to pass nothing. To and don't you know? And I think that 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 destroys us. You know, we're supposed to you know we're supposed to declare the glory of God from one generation to the next, mm -hmm. train up a child in the way that so well, that's everything that we do. But I have seen for myself that a lot of leaders don't necessarily want to be bothered with them. God God told me this a long time ago. He said, Kathy, I'm gonna send you a lot of Davids. You gonna have to train them up. He said you have to deal with they like. And what my experience <laughs> is this: that you want the gift, but you don't want the mess that come with the gift. Ooh, now see, now you said something right there. Now, just very briefly on that, and then I'm going to go on to these last couple questions. She said, you don't want the mess that comes with the gift. What is Prophetess Kathy talking about? I'll tell you what she's talking about. First of all, she's talking about the demons are going to attack your life because Satan's kingdom is organized, and there is such a thing called a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit is a spirit that's familiar with you and your family. And if they were able to defeat your grandfather, and if they were able to defeat your father, they're going to bring the same thing into your life as young as possible. If it's liquor, if it's drugs, if it's temper, if it's laziness, if it's relationships, if it's being bad with money, go back and study your family history. If it's divorce, if it's premature death, if it's chronic sickness, as soon as the devil sees you in your mother's womb because the devil's going to attack your mother if you're an apostle or prophet, if you didn't know that. The devil has known God longer than we have. And the devil sees the anointing in the belly. And Revelation 12 says he stands before the woman in travail to devour her child when she delivers. And so the enemy is going to make a focused, planned attack if God calls you to open your mouth and worship in front of the congregation as a leader. And that's going to have been a part of your life when your mother was carrying you 
So go back and study your family history and ask your mother what she was going through because your birth was prophetic. How you came out and what they named you speaks to your destiny, whether you know that or not. And all that's just number one. Number two, you're going to have to deal with your own flesh. Because if you didn't, my listening audience, if you didn't know this, whatever you have in your spirit when you sing and play, it breathes out into the air and gets on the congregation. That's why people that are living in carnality when they do worship, that's why sometimes the anointing is hindered and it's not as strong as it normally is. And that's why whatever it is that they're into, you will notice that that will begin to break out in the church, which is why there's such a strong holiness requirement for the, Le- the Levitical call or any type of singing priest, standing priest, or ushering priest in the body of Christ, because you are breathing out what's in you on them. That's why the enemy loves to put people that are struggling with relationship sin, that are struggling with flesh out of control. That's why you see that so common among musicians or worship leaders. Because if you stand up and, and you minister in front of people, you're literally breathing that on them. So you're going to have to learn how to get your flesh on the cross and don't nobody want to do that, but it's part of the job. That's number two. Number three, she mentioned earlier, Saul and David. And uh, Kathy can tell you, there's going to be a whole bunch of people over the course of your life that are just jealous and envious. I don't know any kind of other kind of words to use. Because that anointing, the worship anointing, the singing, anything you do with arts and music, it draws people. It's designed to draw people. But it's not you. It's the anointing. But people that don't have that won't believe that, don't care. And then they might get in the spirit of Cain. And the spirit of Cain is where you would rather destroy your brother than get right with God yourself. All that comes with being a worship leader. And I'm just scratching the surface. I'm just talking about basic stuff. I haven't gotten to any deep stuff. This is like one-on-one stuff. And that's what you mean when you say there's there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's going to be people on your worship team who want to be the leader. Maybe they don't have leadership potential. Or maybe they do have leadership potential, but they don't know how to submit. So they're going to come in trying to take over, trying to tell you what to do. There's going to be uh, pastors who don't understand that the prophetic and the pastoral have to work hand in hand. If you ask the Lord what to preach, the worship leader has to ask the Lord what to sing, and they will dovetail every time. But if that's a function of the Holy Ghost, people can't do that. And if y'all ain't spirit-filled and y'all not on the same page, it's going to be a mess. They're going to be preaching one thing, worshiping, going to be singing something else, and people are going to be scratching their heads. How about what they talking about? So it's a lot. It's a lot. We're just scratching the surface, but this is for my listening audience. So it's a serious call if you've been called to lead worship on any level in writing, in playing an instrument, in singing, or all three. So you're going to have to get ready for that because that's what comes with it. Not just getting on stage or getting a platform or, or whatever you think the glory side is. There's a whole bunch of stuff come with that. That's what you're talking about. And and also, mainly, David's life. You know, I always use David as an example of, you know, when he said, Kathy, I'm going to send you, he said, I'm going to send you David. David was very gifted, mm-hmm. very talented, and but he had issues, you know, he had his yes. own personal issues. And sometimes I just feel like, personally, I just feel like, you know, people have, they want the gift, but they don't have time to walk with your character, you know. So yes. that's why you see sometimes and menstruals and some looks like they get a slap on the hand <laughs> and a whole lot of mess and, and, you know it, it looks like they're getting away with a whole bunch of stuff and then it's just i think that's why i say part of that is our fault as well because as leaders you know we we, we are part of the problem which makes which turns them into i want to say hirelings i've taught mistress and apostles and leaders that it's important to establish them mainly bring them into your church you know, five, don't just hire them for just to play for you and then wait at the door for the check, annoying you to death, <laughs> you know, because they waiting on their check, you know. Uh-huh. Then you just, then they go home, but then people, they don't come. Like, they, everybody's, you know, it's two people, and uh, I, I would say the leaders are responsible for that because whatever they've been taught, why did, why did you think that that was appropriate in the first place? Where did you get that model from? It's not even biblical. Right. Men- 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 meant to be harlots, but they were meant to be established 
that David established 24 hour worship. Mm -hmm. One that also is prophetic to this that first it's a lifestyle, second it's governmental. And then he put they, they had a, they had responsibilities, they had families, they had, so they were established people. They weren't just flying by like, oh, pick me next, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's people that were on a schedule. So that was a way of life, and they were consistent in that. And they did that for 40 years. And you can you imagine working alongside of your brothers and your sisters, and none of them never broke rank. That's right. right. That's so right. They did that for 40 years. So I'm just saying that. But but you have to wonder again. It goes back to this: where did they get this model? So that means that as a pastor, for me, as a, I say, as an apostle about a church of pastor, whatever. It is in my best interest to make sure that my minstrel is well. His life is well. The psalmist is well. I, you know, and if I can't afford to employ them by net, you know, if I, if I give them, uh, you know, something financially, then I will do. I would, it would be my goal to do that mm -hmm. because you don't want them to be hopping here and there. That's how. The, that's the other way that mixture comes in, and then some. Some of them become so disconnected. They just like, oh, is it? They run out like after the like after the first part of the service is the devotion is over the worship part of of his over music and they go to this next corner store or whatever or hang out or whatever then they come back in town enough to the play the the, the, the closing music that's right <laughs> they come back to that never they never get a, they, they're not baptized but I say we need to baptize them and by I mean by that you know pull them into the environment. You know, treat them as a believer, not as a just a gift. Like, what? How are you? Right? You, know, you take the new members class, and that's what we did. That we said is we established that. You know, we established that we have to have taken this class, even if you came from another church. Or if, if we wanted to make that, if I wanted to make exceptions, that would be solely on me. But the greater responsibility was on me to watch over them. Like, okay, if I see red flags or this and that, or whatever, it's 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 a weighty of it's a we have to deal with the way it matters when it comes to menstruals and psalmists and it involves their life. Don't think that they don't have kids. Don't think that they have problems. Because yes, they bring a whole bunch of problems. And yes, you were right. Demons love certain spirits to attack uh, menstruals and psalmists. Mm -hmm. Lust. Not that nobody in the church can wrestle with lust. But we know that where that, that the level of glory and glitter and that all that that comes upon the menstrual and psalmists People look at it because you're down, you're down at the congregation and the, and the missions are up there, so they're being looked up to. The Bible says this. He's God says, if I be lifted up, right? You no, know, not the menstrual and so He says, then I would draw all men unto me. But if you look at the nature of eight, let's say eight chapter people, the Jedith, these the musicians, these are prophets, prophetic leaders. The Bible says that eight, one of the things about Asap, his character, his personality, he was to gather. Mm -hmm. So there's a gathering on you on that having the grace to gather. But a lot of times people they get all big headed like, oh look at me. Ah, no, 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 no. I, you know, I'm I'm the people gathering to me. And they never really become transformed. And the gift and call is without repentance. Think about it. Well you know, your but, your I, gift, what God puts in your spirit, is like the skin on your body. That's what people don't understand. When God puts something in your spirit, it becomes a part of you like your skin is wrapped in your body. That doesn't have anything to do with your character. That doesn't have anything to do with love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance. That has to be grown or developed. And a lot of people haven't gotten by for so long on their worship anointing until they've never been called to the accounting of their character when it comes to the other things. And then sometimes they don't have a safe space where they can be honest. Because one of the things that Christians do is make you feel like you've got to be perfect. You can't struggle if you save, which is not to struggle. What Bible are you reading that says you ain't going to struggle just because you know the Lord? Yes, you will. But but sometimes in church settings, you don't you don't have the safe space. And then, like you said, if you play and then you duck out and you go to the stop and go or the quick mark and you get some liquor or some cigarettes or some popcorn or a Snickers or whatever, and then you don't come back until the pastor's winding up. You have not gotten a word. Okay, there's no word that has gotten to your spirit because you're off doing something else. That's another thing. And so it, it's what you keep coming back to is what is your model? What is your model? What, how have you been taught is the proper way? Now, let me ask you this uh, before we wrap up. 
What has what kind of revelations has the Lord given you about the rest of 2020? I just got through ministering about some stuff that the Lord was showing me, but what, what kind of revelations and stuff? Because we're in September now and we're heading into right. quarter four. And so what kind of stuff has the Lord been showing you? I mean, stuff that you can share because, you know, you can't tell everything, oh, you know, see, but stuff that you can share. What what has that been? Well, first of all, it's not so much as 2020 particularly in the, in the frame of 2020 as in days and numbers, but more so what 2020 looks like, what 2020 beholds and, and how 2020 is so instrumental to our decade, the next decade or the next 20 years of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I started talking to me about this before the pandemic, before we knew it was going to be a pandemic. Mm-hmm. And one thing I did notice about this, and even some of my team members always bring this back to my memory before the pandemic hit, there would be times in worship where I was just standing there and I would see, I would get a glimpse that this was passing away. Like the way that we were worship and that standing up there doing worship, it was passing away. And I, it was something in that I, you know, how the Bible says we know in part. I knew something was changing, but I didn't know when, when, how. But I would get a glimpse during praise and worship that did us. And I would say this the day will come, you may even remember me saying this, but we would no longer, be, I would no longer be standing here. Leading praise. I wasn't talking about, like, I have a dream. It wasn't that. Mm. Was about, I could sense that something was coming and that we was this was about to change the way that we get, the way we worship. Mm-hmm. I felt like God, this is the thing, I felt like God wanted to change our worship. He wanted to make adjustments. Now, the word I would, would, would prefer to use is the word adjustments to worship. Mm-hmm. I could sense that so many of us have gotten so far away from God that no matter how we and we were caught in, I used the word vortex. I felt like I would tell the prophets, I feel like we're caught with that. Christians are caught in the in vortex and God wants to get us out so we can have a tangible relationship. We're so deep in the vortex that we can't, we have, we can't even see which way is up or which way is out. We're just swirling and swirling and swirling. Mm-hmm. People are, are sick. People are, people need to be refreshed. People need to be revived. I said, we just own this thing and it's just going. And we right smack dead in the eye of in the middle of it. And God wants to do something that has something to say. And then, then I was getting vexed with all the media stuff, you know, with all the stuff that you see on Facebook, all the everybody's just more concerned about numbers and fans and stuff like that. I get, I understand some things are necessary, but I didn't quite understand it all. And to, to this day, I still don't understand why some people live for the screen in such a way that, it's, that they think you can't see. All I can say is it's just pure, pure vanity. The mm-hmm. other thing, one of the Lucifer's biggest issues, remember God told him, if you study Ezekiel 28, he says, iniquity was found in you. Right. So, something, something that we, the place that we were and, the, and, where, and what we had come is not, I didn't feel like it was the idea of God. So I felt like an adjustment was made for the body of Christ. Now, as a lady here, one of the things I've been sharing with people, I said, I feel like that Satan is saying to, to the world, is, is accusing God of not being able to save. Come on. Wow. You know how, you know, not being able to save. So if I, I do this, I always look at patterns because I'm a seer. I always just, that's just the way I look at things. And I started looking back as far as 2017, but as it pertains to the question, so I'm going to stay right on that. And I started looking, I said, you know, guys, notice how some of you mega, I said, pay attention to the word mega. We started using the word mega, 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 but also mega churches. And then, and, and, and suddenly you start seeing mega leaders leave the church, mega leaders leave the faith, megas need to commit suicide, mega leaders decided that they want to get a man lover. Mm-hmm. You know, come on, some of the things they wanted to change the way, the natural way. And when you start seeing things like that, the suicide, the, the changing of the, the, you know, the homosexuality, like blatant one, because they want this thing so bad that they want to try to change the laws, or in other words, change the timing. And who does that? Satan and I kept seeing the enemy want to change our times and our seasons before the presence of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Because you know, God gave time to us. And the Bible says that God makes all things beautiful in his time. So he can get us off of the course of God. So one of the strategies I noticed that so 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 the news started recording NBC, ABC, big top of the mega church, mega church pastor, mega church pastor commit suicide, mega church pastor. Leave church, mega church pastor, get caught in a sexual three ring, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. These people, listen, 
These people care nothing about the kingdom. These people that's reporting this, they care nothing about God's people. It's just news to them. And it's the voice of the enemy saying, ha ha, your God can't save. Look at you there. Look at all these mega churches. Because they don't care what's going on in the local church. We could be raising the dead in the local church. They care nothing about it. Why? Because it's not mainstream. It's not hidden in the airway. So one, I felt like Satan, the accuser of the brethren, wants to accuse God of not being God. Can he save? Can he, can he stretch out his arm and save this world from the pandemic? What can he do? So there's a lot of voices just talking about that. But the first thing God told me when the pandemic first hit was that the enemy wants to change our seasons and our timing. And you say, how does he do, does that? He can, he can, the, the way that he can change your timing is to get you over to sin, get you over to doubt, get you over to unbelief, and fear the main thing. Get you over to fear. Mm-hmm. So when people started dying because of COVID, a lot of saints, people at Facebook, a lot of people became extremely afraid. What does the Bible says about fear? He says, for fear, men are, men, men are to fail. Mm-hmm. When people get in fear, insanity and all kind of things like that happen. So you just not really being yourself. So what does that mean? So what, 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 what does that look like? And then, and then God starts saying to me about the worship. He says, I want to have that experience. I say, I want my people to have this experience that I had with Adam in the cool of the day. So the turnaround is this. You know, I, I was I look at everything also from the scripture. My people who are called by my name. Yes. He quoted that, ate that, and nobody <laughs> did really fast. Come on. Have you heard that? But this is, did you get an invitation to the solid vicinity and I didn't get one? Hello? I just talked about that, Joel, too. I just talked about that in my broadcast about we're supposed to call a solemn assembly and call a fast. And nobody did. <laughs> this is what God is doing. I believe this. I believe. I'm telling you, I've, I've been living in this. And the other thing is he's dealing with us individuals. Now, you, you, whatever God tells you to do right now, it is so important that you focus on it. If he's saying, I want you to take care of yourself. I want you to work on this area of your health. Because God always looks at the big picture. David said, you were gentle and making me great. There's areas, the church and people, the people, the, when I say the church, the people have suffered so many things and we've just been so religious. How I know? Because the Bible says religion makes void the power of God. Mm-hmm. When you start seeing less of the power of God and more traditional things, you just see everybody just showing up. You know, it's just my turn to be on the thing today. Where's the power of God? You coming back to the same stuff, and then you look up and you don't see no leaders. And then what was the scripture say? When when the ungodly is in leadership, the people lose all restraint. Or one translation said that they become unhappy mm-hmm. because there's no leadership there. Mm-hmm. Because the leadership of the, the body of Christ has started to dwindle down because people are trying to survive. I don't want to survive. He said, "I came in to give life and life more abundant." So the frank, just to keep it on the framework, to, to try to speed it up, is that. One, the accuser of the brethren is accusing God of not being God in this hour. Look at this, the pandemic. Y'all, y'all, he can't say y'all. We did this all the passes, all the fat black. And I'm just going to say it the way, you know, a big old fat, <laughs> fat passes, that. You know what they did. You know, they said it. Then they made all the black people that we, we become now an endangered species. All the uh. religious people in church. <laughs> now you're scared that you're in a dungeon and you can't even come outside. You, ain't, you don't even have a voice with your hollering self. Come on, somebody. You know I'm telling the truth. Mm. And then, then, and then, threaten the future of your family. But mm. the, that's the one thing that God, you could see that God was really breathing on. Look at the school system. Now, some of these parents who were working these and amazing hours or just crazy hours now have some that quit their jobs. Why? Because now you're going to sit in front of the computer with your child. Now you're going to train your child up in the way that they should go. Listen, now you cannot be complaining about the government and saying, why are you not teaching my kid? Why are you, why are you taking the Bible out of the school? First of all, you put the Bible in them because now you're at home. Don't right. worry about the institution. See, we build out an institution, a system to do this. God says, I've never, he says, I don't even dwell in temples made with hands. And why would I dwell in the midst of an institution? What happened, my people? Where are my people? That's right. And so, we, and so the, well, I call it the microwave world. We, we got introduced to a microwave world all of a sudden. And we did, and we brought that model into the local church. We, and listen, God should say that the gates of hell should not prevail again. He says, upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail. And that is what he's still saying. 
But this time, it's not just going to be a TKO like Mike Tyson in the ring. If he just knock out in eight seconds, 15 <laughs> seconds. No, 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 no. He says, what you're going to have to do, my saints, so my sons and daughters, he said, in the ring, and you're going to go all 12 rounds. And I said, what does that look like? He said, you're going to exercise your gift. You're going to exercise your faith. You're going to believe me. You're going to do all the things that you've been taught to do. Hello. Mm-hmm. Pray. Fast. Believe. Come on. I'm going to put on the full armor of God. Yes. Because we want God to rescue us and go back to the same stuff instead of being transformed. God wants right now we are in a season of transformation. Yes. He's saying, hey, I'm breathing on that, that get that fed off you, get that fed off you. Just do it. Because whatever he's doing in the next season, you cannot survive it. The next decade, the way that you are. So what does a good father does? He does, he looks after us, he cares for us. And then our responsibility, and this is the, the, the finality of it all this is, if we don't repent, then if we don't turn away from God, we run the chances of, and this is what grieves me, because I always think of the next generation. If this, if, as we as a people, if we don't turn and repent, God as a, as a group, he'll deal, he's going to deal with us as individuals. But the thing is, the repentance is what's keeping God from us from coming unto judgment. And some of us don't think that God would judge us. As David, when he numbered, when he's numbered the people, it was God who allowed it. Then he told the the, 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 the angel, he said, stop. He told him to stay his hand. At some point, he stopped it. He stopped it. Why? Why is it necessary? So that's the what I feel like right now in, in our worship. That's why I say the turnaround has come back to the that's why some people say reset. I say I'll take the word reset, but he's turning us around because I, I keep going back to this. He came to give us life and life more abundantly mm-hmm. for you to be a better David. But you, but you think you have right now? You're getting ready to come into the abundance and the overflow of that. You got to understand God is investing so much in you, and so He wants to create a platforms, and He wants to be. You dominion in those systems. Notice how entertainment and all those other dimensions and all those other mountains bow down. Mm-hmm. Guess what? The breath of God and where God is focusing. So while David is constructing and building and idealizing with God and walking like with Adam, you know, you should think about man, nurture, man. He's walking with man and, and communing and getting all these amazing ideas. He's putting, he's really resetting you back to the place of your dominion. He says, I gave you power. I gave you dominion over the fowl of the air. And I just told a group of entrepreneurs this. I said, listen, God wants us to, our songs to come from the airway. Now, what do you mean by that? I said, from the heavens. Why? Well, how is that possible? Because he said he gave me power over the airwaves. Mm-hmm. But see, this prince of the air knows that many of us will not even walk walking out of authority. We won't sit in the presence of the Lord and let him to talk on us as a, a company of prophetic people. We won't do that. And most of us won't do it because we broke and don't, and then you're not going to sit up and do it because nobody ain't giving you a check. But how about this? Go do it. Do what God say. Be obedient and let the windows of heaven open up your life that God will pour out a blessing that you have no room to receive it. Yeah, see, what, what, what you're talking faith. about is true faith. You're talking about actual faith and not running your mouth faith. Right. Not just coming to church and going through the motions, but where you got to pull it from the invisible to the visible by what you're absolutely. doing. Yeah, no, I got you. I got you. That's absolutely right, too. But that's that, your setup. But that's that's what a lot of Christians don't understand, because it's what you said. It's a time of polishing. It's a time of bringing out of you what's already in you, because that's what pressure and trying and tribulation does. So bringing out those things, I always say we're like, we can be like, I tell this to the prophets all the time. You know, when you turn your computer on, there's programs that start running to computer, right? Right. They just run back. Sometimes those programs can be outdated. They need to updated and sometimes it can cause problems to your computer. There are things in us that run, that all them from the time we, we, whatever we do, they just run it in the backdrop. They're not always the best things that run in the backdrop. But God's, remember the Bible says that Jesus said, the enemy comes and he finds nothing in me. And whatever God tolerated last season of your life, last decade, last season of this world, it cannot happen. It cannot be there. You know, you, you experience mercy, but God, for two years, God kept telling you to do certain things. But this, but he, he was telling you the whole time because you can't see that far in the future. Come on, somebody. Yeah. So he's saying right now, I didn't, I'm going to stop this train from moving. 
Well, I'm going to get you off the train so that I can heal you, so that you could be a healer to the nations, so that you could be the next Mo the Moses. And the other thing that he spoke to me yesterday, he says, listen, he says, yes, people do look odd, they look strange, he said, but I'm raising up a different kind of people. Like the Bible says that Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. I said, yeah, God, give us a different spirit. So you're not going to, religion is not going to be able to snake people. Because I used to, my, my, my son used to, wear, used to use the word snake. I'm like, snakes? I'm like, snake? Yeah. God gave me that illustration. Religion loves to snake us and get us in the okie doke. But God says, no, you're going to pick that thing off like Paul. Come on. He's like, what? You know, that, that's what's going to happen. So you, so, so I, I keep using you as an example because, because listen, this right here, all the technology, all the things, you know, all the books, you created a place, a place where a flow can come. Let's say a currency, because really the word currency means flow. Mm -hmm, it means mm -hmm. to flow. Right. So you create a current, a currency where God can flow in and through you and you have something in the natural realm that works. You know, tell you what it is, it's the books, it's the CDs, it's the music. You have something in the earth that can be utilized from generation to generation. And in this worldly system, is published. So even when you go, hello, yes. it's still going to continue to flow in the earth. And that's, that's, the etern that's part of the return to the manifest in the natural realm so because if god gives us rewards he, in heaven he also gives us rewards where here that's so right they come to come and you're going to eat the fruit of your labor because of your consistency and you're not afraid to have a different spirit when they just say be like this be like that do it this way da -da 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 -da. no and a man of god going out even the apostolic seed what I've learned about the apostolic is this. Gifts are drawn to the apostolic because the fathering and nurturing grace that comes with the apostolic to release and to send out. God says, go be into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But religious say, nah, you see here. You make sure you pay your tithe and your offering. <laughs> so I can do me a word here. I don't even say that loud. Like that. <laughs> religion, religion never releases people. It makes them dull yes. of hearing and hardness of heart. Yes. So when you get to a, a you have the, that's why I say the right model is important. So you have to take this, because right now, anybody, a person who has eyes to see and ears to hear, this is a school to them. They, mm -hmm. they, they probably like, mm, mm, write that down. Mm -hmm. That's so right. you have taught without even realizing that you are teaching a whole generation. Mm -hmm. And the more that you stay in, because the Bible says, in this world, but we're not of this world, so we have an advantage. We live in two dimensions. Yes, we have an advantage. Well, given and so, and then music. Don't think it's not strange. David says, "Better is one day in your course than a thousand, thousand elsewhere." That's right. Bunch of people don't be God. I'm on some back. That's why I say I'd rather be a, a door a, a doorkeeper. Door door. That's right. Come on, because he understood that he could he could have one foot not being in sin. He could live in this, he could be around these people, worldly people like Saul. But what he craved more than anything was the presence of the presence of the Lord. That's why the, that's why he is depicted or described as an old testament man who entered into a new testament realm. He was already in the future in the old testament. Look, because the priest could not come up on the uh, the Ark of Covenant, keep the bread off the off the table. They was gonna be dead. That's right. <laughs> David was always such an example of doing something supernatural. And the only reason one is hard, partial to it, God, and that he had faith. It was faith. He was demonstrating faith, 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 and motive. I was reading the scripture that says that man, that 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 man's uh, plans are in his own heart, but God, but God is the God that judges his motive, that understands his motive. So you can do whatever you want to do in your own heart. Come on. Mm -hmm. A man thinking he's writing his own heart, but it's God who knows the motives. The motives, that's so right. So being free, people, I'm like, look, this is this thing. But anyway. All right, well. That was satisfactory. No, no, that, that was that was awesome. Uh, to sum up what awesome. Kathy's saying, you know, she's talking about legacy. She's talking about uh, what Noah did. Noah was able to get grace before grace was given because he walked in a prophetic realm. He was able to go before God and not on the basis of his righteousness, but on the basis of God's righteousness. And when you can get up into a prophetic flow in the heavenlies, you can see things before they happen, but you can pull things in your life in the now before they're even released on earth. And so as we go forward, 
into the rest of this year, it's the time for that personal prophetic flow. What is it that God is trying to pull out of you that's going to bless the nations, both in the now and in the world to come? Amen and amen. Well, this was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you uh, coming through and doing an interview. There's so many nuggets in here, so many things that you uh, were able to release and bless. And I'm going to make sure uh, everybody says, yeah, go ahead and plug your book again. <laughs> <laughs> this is my book, y'all. I'm not just I'm just being, I'm, I'm, real, I'm very nice. I just want you to know that, but I'm actually a professional as well. Uh, the title of this book is The Dynamics of Prophetic Worship. You can also purchase this book on Amazon.com. Let me see. Any of the social outlets or anything like that is, is, I think it's like 12 or 13 bucks. It is an amazing book. This book was not just written for a praise and worship team. And when I wrote this book, I did not have the praise and worship team uh, focused just in mind. I had I was focused on the believer. How can I get the believers to walk in the supernatural realm? Um, in the book, you also would find my testimonies of different things. Even when I was teaching a preaching, when miracles would take place. I was in Amsterdam. I wasn't even singing. I was just teaching, and all of a sudden, a person who was blind for 10 years, 11 years, folks started getting up out of the chair. All kind of miracles took place. And this, the scripture that I read to you out of Hebrews 2 and, uh, Hebrews 2 and 12, I was teaching out that scripture because I, what happened was I began to talk about how what happens when Jesus is in the midst of the service and all of a sudden miracles started taking place. This is the type of lifestyle that God wants us to live, and this is the benefits of the prophetic worship. And many people uh, don't understand it, don't want to walk in it, and I think it's because of error, maybe time past errors, because I don't think, I mean, everybody, if, if somebody's giving away something free, we want it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, we want it. But I believe that the mo the biggest error in prophetic worship is just not knowing or just having a poor experience with some type of prophetic thing. But God, you still got to obey the voice of the Lord. You still got to read your Bible. You still got to be a prophetic because that's what God said. And Joel 2 and 28 says, he says, I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I always got to ask yourself, why did God want us all to prophesy? That's you. I'm going I'm to let you search that out. But that's what God said. He says, your, my sons, he says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men dream, dream, your, you know, young men dreams, visions, and old men, all that. God wants us to be filled with his spirit. I'll give you one word and to go off of it. It's, somebody say glory. Glory, yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. You're welcome.